Uh, welcome to our series on the election, and uh, today we have um, Dr. Eamon Butler, who is the director of the Adam Smith Institute. Hello. Thank you. Hello. And, uh, um, and I, I'd like you to um, provide some little bit of insight into our coming election, so uh, if, if that's okay. And... Uh, <clears throat> So, what do you think of the uh, essentially the uh, the lineup of the parties at the moment economically, and their, their different, different views? I think it's deeper than economics. I think that uh, neither of the main parties uh, seems to have um, a compass as to where it wants to get to. Uh, the conservative philosophy has simply been uh, let's just wait and things will get better which mm, they have to some extent, but not very much, maybe not enough to make a difference. Um, and Labour's uh, policy is to say absolutely noth nothing wherever possible, um, because all they have to do is uh, is nothing, and the Conservatives will lose the election for, the, for themselves. That's, the, that's their thinking. So uh, neither of them are, are very attractive uh, offers, I don't think. Um, and uh, now during the campaign, you know, we see all sorts of extravagant uh, promises being made and uh, like this one on the uh, pension system where uh, the idea is that uh, pensions won't be won't be taxed anymore. The tax uh, uh, threshold will be raised above the pension. So you've effectively got a quadruple lock. And this means that pensioners like myself, um, you know, do extremely well out of this. But people like my son end up paying the bill. And it's just uh, the pension system has become a, a Ponzi scheme. And that, I think, is, is something which is going to eclipse nearly everything else because the sums of money involved are enormous. So it hardly matters what your economic policy is um, if you are going to have uh, continue with a pension and welfare system, which is uh, really so extravagant and so unaffordable. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, OK, uh, so... Um... So the Conservatives um, throughout their period in office, uh, how would you how would you assess them and their sort of, uh, I mean, how conservative have they been? Well, I don't think they've been conservative at all. I mean, I think that it started with um, with Cameron, who wanted to be, you know, green and touchy feely and uh, all things to all people. Um, and uh, it's more or less carried on uh, from there. And, and I think that, that the trouble for the Conservatives is that that has lost uh, a lot of their, their core supporters. They can normally uh, aim to get about a third of, uh, of uh, Conservatives voting. This time, I think they'll be lucky to get to get 25. So um, that, it really has hit their core supporters. And, uh, uh, you know, fine, there are many things I approve of, like, uh, you know, Cameron's view on, on gay marriage and all, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but at the same time, uh, most Conservative supporters are probably um, disappointed at how it's turned out. You know, we had, uh, you know, we had Cameron. Uh, uh, Boris looked quite promising for a while, and that's, I think, why he was supported by the, um, the, uh, the membership. But uh, in office, he turned out to be, well, you know, net to zero, which is unaffordable and, uh, uh, you know, various other promises, extravagant promises and lots of bailouts for individuals and firms and so on. Um, so, you know, these aren't sort of conservative principles. And I think their supporters have uh, deserted them. And the trouble, their, their problem is that their supporters are just going to stay at home. They might not vote for for Labour, some will, but um, you know they'll just stay at home, and then that's the way to lose an election. Yes. Okay. Uh, and what about? Um, and of course, and of course. By the way, you, you've had all the you, you've had all the Brexit uh, kerfuffle yeah. as well. That uh, the country voted uh, in favour of Brexit, and uh, uh, you know I remember uh, Dimbleby on on the evening of the poll saying, uh, you know, at three in the morning. Well, that's it. We're out. Well, no, we're not out. We're still in, as far as I can see. Yeah. We're still taking all the European regulations, and we haven't really opened up trade to other places, because you know Cameron himself, you know, resigned on the on the, the day after the poll. Uh, indicating that you know he wasn't going to drive this thing through on behalf of the great British public, 
the establishment have been generally against it, the civil service and the and the commentators. Uh, and so again, I think conservative voters are extremely irritated uh, that uh, we've had Brexit in name, but but not in fact. Yes, with the, with the resistance by the civil service and and various the quangocracy and the uh, and very supranational supranationals and what have you, uh, do you think any government could get through uh, the the um, the Brexit rewards, shall we say? <laughs> well, I hope we haven't missed our chance. Uh, because I do feel that uh, there's a bit of rhetoric uh, has been coming out of uh, Labour, although it might change, but it, a, a bit of rhetoric has been coming out about how we need to be closer to Europe and, you know, part of the single market and all of this kind of stuff. And it's fine to be part of the single market if you're exporting goods to the single market. But it seems to me quite pointless that we should lumber small businesses in the UK who don't export to, to the continent um, to to lumber them with all of the rules and regulations uh, that we impose on big companies who do export uh, their goods and services to the to the continent. So uh, I hope that we haven't missed the opportunity. And uh, you know, I'm optimistic that trade will continue to to expand, um, certainly as we come out of the COVID era. Um, and uh, so that's that's good. But in terms of uh, deregulation. I can't see it happening on either side. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, does Rachel Reeve um, fill you with confidence? As well, as... <laughs> yeah. well um, she does try to strike a certain amount of uh, confidence, but, uh, um, you, you know, you do ask where the money's coming from. You know, she does say, well, we need growth. Well, yes, absolutely right. And that was Liz Truss's view as well. She didn't get it right exactly, but... Uh, uh, but her view was that we need growth, and, uh, and Liz uh, thought that um, uh, she had to act straight away because it takes a couple of years, two, maybe two, two and a quarter, two and a half years, before the effects of tax cuts make themselves felt. And uh, Liz was looking at an election coming up in two and a half years' time, so she felt that she had to move straight away. And that took her, many of her colleagues by surprise. But she'd also inherited from Boris this 80 billion pounds. That's a lot of money. That's, you know, that's a thousand pounds and more per man, woman and child in the UK. Um, 80 billion pound bailout package for households, whether they were rich or poor, they would get a bailout package to help pay for their for their energy bill. So it was a very extravagant program. And she didn't do anything to rein in that. I think she felt that, uh, well, that was that was accepted, you know, it had gone through, everybody was agreed on that one. Uh, but uh, at the same time, then there were uh, tax cuts and, and so on. So uh, it, the books didn't balance. And then the Bank of England, you know, again, part of the establishment pulled the plug on her. They could have saved it, but, uh, but they chose not to. So they, all the responsibility is them. So Rachel Reeves is saying exactly the same thing, that we need growth, is the Labour Party committed to uh, reducing taxes and cutting public expenditure and doing all these things that would allow enterprise to flourish? Well, previous form, not really. And I think, you know, they may feel, they may get a lot of pressure from their left, just like uh, Tony Blair did, um, to carry on spending and, and to put greater burdens on on business like uh, workplace regulation right okay i mean do you think uh, the mini budget could have worked if it was um, if it was couched in a different way or was, was uh, whatever no i think probably the figures didn't add up I, I, I as i say i mean i think the uh, uh, you know you're talking about liz, liz yes, Truss's liz budget Lincoln, yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, the figures didn't add up. Uh, that's true, but you know the argument is well, you know you have to go for go for growth, and and then uh, the economy starts growing again, and then you can afford to pay off all this debt. Mm -hmm. So um, that was that was the feeling. Um, but uh, I I think probably if the Bank of England had we got into a downward spiral in the pension system because if your fund isn't liquid, you have to sell assets. So then you just then you have to sell more and more and more because the price keeps going down. So um, so that's where we were. And the Bank of England could have arrested that. 
the Bank of England could have changed the liquidity rules on pensions and it could have carried, carried the government on through, uh, but it chose not to. And it's just one of their many, many bad decisions over the last uh, few years. I mean, it's, you know, uh, shameful incompetence. And that's why we've had it, such raging inflation uh, because they've been creating money hand over fist. No. So what, what would you say, what, uh, any government, whether it was the British government or or an incoming government, uh, be it sort of Labour or Reform or, or Lib Dem or whatever, uh, what advice would you give? <laughs> well, I wouldn't start from here, but uh, uh, I think that one of the first things I would suggest is there are some easy things that we, you could do if you're determined enough to do it. And one of those would be to uh, remove a very large number of planning controls mm -hmm. to uh, basically repeal the 1947 Town and Country Planning Act and to allow people to build houses on uh, ground which is designated as green uh, belt, but is in fact anything but green. In fact, it's probably filthy and uh, contaminated and all the rest of it. So, the, uh, and to build, you know, near to uh, stations and underground stations and, and tram stations around our cities, and also to allow street boats so that uh, people who live in a a row of semis can decide to uh, replace them by, you know, six-story flats like you have in <laughs> every other European city, um, and that would uh, greatly increase the supply of housing. Um, of course, I mean it's very bad for people who own houses, which is why the Tories uh, seem so reluctant to do it. But uh, Robert Jenrick, you know, nearly nearly got that going. So I think that's probably an easy one: planning reform so that people can live where they want to, live near their work, and so that young people in particular can actually afford a home instead of living with their parents or, or paying half their salary in, in rent. Um, it's, it's a huge amount they have to pay. So I think that's, that's the first thing. And then to, to start the process of deregulation and, and, and scaling down the, the Brussels regulations that you know, are still overhanging us, I think that's extremely important as well. And then yes, the growth agenda is important. You know, clearly, you have to take your time. We're in deep debt, and uh, if you get into deeper debt, then people get a bit nervous. But um, I think if you explain what it is that you're doing and why, uh, then the markets will accept more debt, uh, provided they think that at the end of it, you're going, you're actually going to generate economic growth. You're in, going to encourage the development of small businesses. And uh, then you know, then they'll say, well, in that case, GDP will grow and uh, debt will get a become a smaller percentage of the, of the total. So those are, those are really the big things, I would say. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, regarding the the new kid on the block reform, uh, would you say that their um, policies are credible? And uh, and if so, um, do you think they have any chance of ever implementing them? Well, I think that um, some of their policies I agree with and some I don't, and some I'm not exactly sure about. I think that the thing with reform is that it is, uh, if you like, putting an ideological or a moral case almost, which has been lacking in the Tories and is lacking in the in the Labour Party. So I think that that is their stance, that they, they want to point out that the current system is not benefiting ordinary people, ordinary people feel alienated uh, by it. I, I mean, they, it's quite likely that they would uh, poll, um, well, I don't know what the, the total polling numbers are, but, but in terms of gaining seats, I think probably it's going to be zero, uh, that the first past the post system doesn't help that sort of uh, party and doesn't help third parties in general. And uh, it means that uh, you know a lot of conservative votes will go to to reform. I think most conservative votes will, voters will stay at home, but but some will go to to reform, and uh, and and that will weaken the conservative message even even further. So so I think that that reform is is really about um, stating a position which actually most of the great British public seem to largely agree with it, both Labour and Tory supporters. Uh, you know, they think there's a lot of, lot of sense in it and that uh, 
they're fed up with these professional politicians that you've got in Westminster. Um, so who knows? They may pick up more sport than than we imagine. Mm. Okay. And uh, do you think the that politics in general, party politics in general, has sort of passed its sell by date, and sort of uh, we're 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 on the cusp of um, something completely new? But uh, whether whether good or bad, or or whether we're going to sort of end up um, essentially have dem democracy being a sort of um, some, something of the past, and we're 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 in the position whereby we're run by the civil service rather than sort of the government's actually um, ordering it about, so to speak. I know something about this subject actually because I I wrote a book on on democracy, oh. and uh, actually my great aunt was a suffragette, uh, and uh, you know force fed in prison and all that stuff. Um, so, you know, I'm all in favor of uh, women having the vote, but the wider you made the franchise, then the more, more legitimate um, democracy has, has become. And we have got ourselves into a mindset where we think democracy is absolutely fabulous. It's wonderful. And every politician tells us, oh, democracy is, you know, the best possible system, you know, uh, you know uh, over and above all the, all the others. And then they start saying, and that's why we should decide more things democratically. So uh, that means that we decide your healthcare democratically, we decide your education democratically, uh, we decide your public services uh, democratically, we even decide the, the size of your fizzy drinks can <laughs> democratically. We, and we, we, we decide democratically um, what you can eat and what you can put into your body. Now that is, to me, that's, that is stretching democracy well beyond its limits. And I think democracy only works as the Greeks and Romans and the uh, founding fathers of America <laughs> realized, only works if it's limited. It's got to be limited in scope, uh, the number of different things that, that, you can, that you can use it for, and it's got to be limited in terms of its power. Democracy exists to make the decisions that we cannot make for ourselves, and there are precious few of those. Uh, there are very few things that we really need to decide collectively, but that's the system that uh, has now uh, evolved or that democracy has morphed into. And it's morphed into a kind of populism because uh, uh, the politicians are driven by the, the headlines. They're driven by the interest groups that, that arise thinking, oh, you know, we can build this system. You know, we, we're against uh, uh, smoking, so we'll put pressure on uh, politicians to, to ban it absolutely everywhere, even in people's own homes and, so, and all the rest of it. Or we're against obesity, we think it's terrible, um, so you know we'll stop people eating uh, bacon and eggs for breakfast or, or whatever it is. So uh, that takes, takes life well beyond the proper, proper purpose of uh, democracy. So I think, I think that is a real problem. And that is why people throughout Europe and indeed in, in America with, with Trump and so on are saying a plague on all your houses. You, uh, you're you not representing us. This is not the life that we want to lead. We want to lead our own lives without you nannying us all the time. Yes, indeed. So you so you would um, go with the idea that, uh, that the best form of government is the one, is one we don't notice, so to speak. Oh, I would love that. Yes, I, you know, I would I'd love a... I'd love a, uh, a government so small it didn't really matter who won the election. Yes. <laughs> that would be delightful, yes. That's I mean, you do need, I'm, you know, I'm a liberal, I'm not a libertarian. You do, uh, you know, I'm a sort of classical liberal. Uh, but you do need uh, government to, to organise certain things like defence and, and the justice system and, and so on and so on. But the trouble is when you have that establishment, there, then power tends to accumulate to it, and then it's used for all other purposes. And uh, um, as Lord Acton didn't quite say, power is delightful, and absolute power is absolutely delightful. So when people have got power, they want more of it, and uh, uh, that's the source of our problems. Hmm. Thank you. So, um, how do you how do you see everything unfolding now? Uh, I mean, I mean. Conservatism, that is. I mean, sort of. Um, do you? Um, I mean, has it been destroyed utterly by by the 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 whole um, Brexit debate and and uh, the uh, and what have you? I mean, sort of. 
What do you think? No, I think that the British public are fundamentally conservative. And generally speaking, they vote conservative uh, for most of the last hundred years, well, really since the Conservative Party um, was created with the, the Tamworth, Peel's Tamworth Manifesto. Um, they have actually been in office for the great majority of that time um, because people generally are conservative by, by disposition. They don't like um, radical uh, change being promised and radical parties coming up and saying, oh, you know, vote for us and we'll completely redesign society. They prefer uh, gradual change. And I think that uh, the Conservatives got to understand the principles of, of conservatism um, as, as, if you like, as, as an ideology or as a, a, a political um, theory. Uh, it's not the same as uh, just being against all change because you just feel uncomfortable when things change. It is that you allow change to happen, but it has to happen in a um, in, in a careful way, and that's why we have rules and institutions and parliaments, and why uh, laws take a long time to discuss and decide. It's so that you don't uh, jump into doing something uh, which you, then you you later regret. Of course, the, the the way that it has turned out now, you have very powerful party machines. And if the prime minister and a few colleagues uh, decide that uh, um, we're going to imprison everybody who wears purple socks, then the party votes for it. And that's what happens. So I think we need more more independence on the back benches. That's that's for sure. But we also need a, a clearer vision of what uh, conservatism is actually all about. And uh, if the conservatives are indeed out of office for uh, five years or 10 years or however long it is, maybe that gives them the time to to think about it. They may be down to a very small parliamentary group, and much of that will be kind of centrist, which doesn't bode well. But uh, at the same time, I think, you know, there are a lot of conservatives who may not even call themselves conservative party members uh, out there who, you know, have this idea, you know, they, you know, they, they know that, yes, we want change, but we don't want radical and sudden change uh, where it upsets our entire system of values. Yes, but I mean, after after um, a period out of office, I mean, Labour may have entrenched itself so much that uh, that catching up would be all all a new Conservative government could do. No, people get fed up with the government uh, after a while, and governments implode after a while. But uh, you know, I mean, we saw that even with Mrs. Thatcher, you know, I could see it. I knew knew her reasonably well. And you could see that after, it's usually about sort of seven years, after about seven years, you have to keep then justifying everything that you've done in the last seven years. So beyond that, it's, it's even more so. And even if it's turned out to be a mistake, you still have to say, oh no, we did the, we did the right thing and we just need to do more of it. Well, no, if it's a mistake, you should be doing less of it. So I think governments, uh, you know, then, are faced by lots of criticism and pressure, and they um, uh, they retreat in, into their bunker, uh, and then you know that's when they lose uh, public support. There's another phenomenon. It may be less now after Brexit, actually, but uh, but uh, during our membership of the of the um, European Union, actually, I asked my old history professor, you know, why, why is it that. Uh, uh, prime ministers seem to spend so much time abroad, and he said that well, it's it's perfectly normal. It's human nature that when you go abroad, you get red carpets, and there's lots of flunkies bowing and scraping and fetching you things, and and there's you know, the flags and all the rest of it. And at home, all you get is journalists and uh, members of the public criticizing you all the time. So naturally, uh, you know, prime ministers and senior uh, senior ministers tend to to spend a lot more. Uh, time abroad, so that that might be less of a phenomenon now. But uh, uh, you know, so perhaps we'll be concentrating on our own issues a little bit more. I think. Yes, and, and regarding the Labour Party, I, I mean, the left of the Labour Party, even in the even the centre, as in Gateskill, I mean, sort of were were quite um, Eurosceptic. What went wrong? I don't know. I think it's an establishment thing. I think it's a it's a sort of class thing as much as anything else that it's uh, there's a certain class of people who who like traveling in Europe fine I like traveling in Europe but there's a certain 
lots of people who like traveling in Europe and then then they say, oh, well, wouldn't it be so much easier if we all had the euro and then there wouldn't be any exchange controls and that would save us a lot of money? Wouldn't it be so nice if we didn't have passport controls, we could just go anywhere we like and all the rest of it? Um, you know, and then you are, you know, basically to he heading towards a, a, a super state. And I think that's that's the problem. And I think that there are a number of people in the Labour Party, for example, who do think, I mean, you know, the 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 EU is to some extent it's 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 a socialist enterprise. I mean, you can see that in the tax policy, for example, where they, they're trying to have minimum taxes throughout the world. Minimum taxes, you need tax competition so that if people can run their governments cheaper and better, um, then they should be allowed to do it, not to uh, to raise raise taxes to the European level. What's so magical about the European level? It's so outrageous. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I, th I think there's that kind of uh, kind of mentality, uh, not just in the Lib Party, in the Conservatives as well, and certainly in the Lib Dems, uh, that um, I think will be, is, is actually proving quite hard to, to break. I mean, there are, you know, a number of of people in the Labour Party who are sceptical, but um, I think they probably tend to be more on the left, actually. Hmm. Okay. Well, right now, I think, I think uh, is there anything you would like to say uh, yourself? I mean, uh, to the... To yes, the well, absolutely. You know, well, you know, my fear is that uh, you, get a, you get a Labour government and then it turns out to be like the Blair government, which I remember. And uh, when Blair came to power in uh, 1997, uh, we decided as an institute that we would uh, uh, do our best to support the good policies uh, that he had and uh, not to support the bad policies that he had. Um, so uh, we did that. And of course, if you remember in the early days, he appointed Frank Field, who, who died just a, a month or so ago, he appointed Frank Field as uh, welfare minister, social security minister, and told him that he had to think the unthinkable about welfare reform. And we thought that's great. You know, we'll we'll help on this. You know, we can we can do some good thinking on welfare reform. And then, of course, a year later, Frank Field had thought the unthinkable, and as a result, he got fired. <laughs> so, at that point, I th I think I sort of thought, well, that's it. The experiment is over. You know, it's it's. Uh, it's not a reforming government. It's a it's a, a a government of PR, and that's how it continued. And and you know what does Blair have to be remembered by apart from taking us into the workplace regulations of the EU and the the social chapter of the EU, which was disastrous and which I think did turn public opinion against the EU quite quite sizably. Certainly turned my opinion, and. Uh, uh, you know, so you know. Oh, oh and, and the you know Gulf War. I mean, but that's about the, the sole uh, measure of his achievements. So you know, what I fear is that we're in for another five or ten years of of that kind of uh, drift. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, sir. You've been very kind. Thank you.